Hey everybody, Patrick Sheridan here at the 2019 CBDNA National Conference at the Tempe Center for the Arts, and I'm joined today by Dr. Tom McCauley, the uh, director of bands uh, and uh, the conductor of the Montclair State University Wind Ensemble. That's going to take the stage here in just a minute. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Yeah, Happy, this, proud. This is wonderful uh, that you guys are here. Are the, are the are the students pretty pretty excited? They're over the top. They really are. Uh, for many of them, this is their very first time out west. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, yesterday, now the weather's not cooperating today, but yes, yesterday, you know, we got out to the airport and I said, okay, folks, that big ball in the sky, that's the sun. <laughs> so, you know, because uh, we haven't had a lot of that back home lately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I'm sorry the weather is not more uh, what it usually is. Here, I think it might be our fault. We might have brought it with us. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I've had a chance to talk to everybody that's about their that we've talked to uh, about their program so far mm -hmm. that, that 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 has played so far and uh, um, ev it was interesting. Everybody had different things that they wanted to bring to the program to their to their program, and some of them were about new music, and some of the things were about uh, 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 messages and uh, um, and and showcasing in some cases people's favorites, in some cases, hey, this is something like. Uh, like last night, uh, Damon's opening piece, mm -hmm. uh, which was a transcription, but it was really like a hoping that she might be able to willing to write something for exactly. for, the, for the for the format. Mm -hmm. So sort of an invitation almost, which is pretty cool. So um, we're gonna go right right into your concert. So can you walk us through the program and a little bit about like well why why you chose these things? Uh, we chose things that are very personal to us mm -hmm. and things that we feel like this audience should hear and be exposed to. Um, and, and therefore, we're not doing any, uh, really any standard uh, wind literature on this particular program. Mm -hmm. um, but we're very excited about it, and we're lucky to have three of the uh, composers here Wonderful. with us today. We open with uh, uh, New Jersey composer Bruce Yurko's uh, little short one minute, 15 second fanfare that he wrote uh, in uh, uh, commemoration of Jack Stamp's uh, retirement. Right, uh, that piece uh, that the five composers did a mm -hmm. different movement each, That's and uh, right. we're doing Bruce's, Bruce's movement. He's wonderful. He's a New Jersey guy, and uh, he's been out to help us several times. He's guest conducted the group. We're just so honored and fortunate to have him here and, and in New Jersey with us. Um, and then we're going to do a tribute uh, to both uh, David Maslanka and Karel Husa, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, do that by way of doing uh, Mr. Maslanka's piece uh, that he wrote not too long before he died called Husa. Yep. And uh, we decided that we would make that uh, a very sort of special moment and a special sort of chamber-like moment. And so the students will play uh, that piece unconducted. And, uh, Fabulous. Uh, and it's been, that's been a marvelous experience for them. It really has. And, uh, uh, you know, it's been very uh, collaborative, like all the way through. Uh, mm -hmm. We insisted on that. And so we're, we're pleased to do that. And then we're going to do a, a, a piece called Harriet that we commissioned about 10 years ago from a good friend of mine who lives in Louisiana lives and works in Louisiana. His name's O'Neill Douglas, and mm -hmm. not many people know his work, but they should. Uh, this, this particular piece uh, is based, uh, inspired by the life and the work of Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. It's in three movements, and uh, it's quite challenging, but O'Neill has quite a voice, and, and uh, you know, and he's been writing for Winds for a long time, and I became aware of him at the Midwest Clinic. Uh, gosh, it's been 25 years ago now. I hate to admit that. But uh, O'Neill's been a good friend, and, and uh, I think the audience is going to really enjoy the piece because we've, well, we've really enjoyed working with it, mm -hmm. uh, preparing. Uh, and then uh, we're going to do a, a, a marvelous piece called Last Breaths uh, by a wonderful uh, Washington, uh, D.C.-based composer named Armando Bajolo. And um, uh, he had written uh, that piece originally for a very small chamber ensemble and baritone, baritone voice and small chamber group. Mm -hmm. Well, a few years ago, David Vickerman from the College of New Jersey at the time uh, uh, sent out a, a message asking who would want to participate in a commission to have uh, Mr. Bejolo expand the instrumentation. And so that's the version we're going to play this afternoon. Um, Last Breaths is a reaction to uh, Mr. Bejolo having lived in Ferguson, Missouri at the time of all of the uh, uh, upheaval at that time, mm -hmm. a few years ago. And he, of course, like so many of us, were uh, angered by what we saw on our televisions. And, uh, and because he's an artist, uh, he did what artists do, and that is express his anger through his music. And so Last Breaths is the uh, result of that time, that anger. And, and it's based, it's a seven movement work, very sh short seven movements. Uh, and it's based on the last words. Each movement is based on the last words of, uh, of an in individual uh, young African-American male 
who was killed by the police. Mm -hmm. um, and the last movement of that piece, the seventh movement, is silent. And it's silent because that young man didn't have a chance to say anything before he was murdered. And so um, wow. uh, we're, yeah, it's, 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 it's not your typical CBDNA fair, but, uh, but we, we thought that it was so powerful and uh, so relevant, quite frankly, um, that uh, we would bring it here. And uh, Mr. Bejola has been a, uh, a real inspiration through the process and uh, very supportive. Uh, we are doing one transcription, and it is a lovely piece uh, by Aaron Copeland called Letter from Home that he wrote for Chamber Orchestra uh, uh, and inspired by the time when he was uh, uh, living and working in Mexico. And we close with uh, Welsh composer Tom Devoren, who's become a really good friend of mine and, and of the bands. And um, uh, he's about to become uh, uh, a new uh, American uh, United States resident uh, soon. And... Um, his piece is called Return to the White City, which uh, refers to the White City Stadium in Wales where uh, uh, when they have Olympic uh, events there, that's where the marathons run. Mm. and Or finished, I should say, where it, should, where it finishes. And um, so th it's inspired by the idea of a marathon. Uh, and it is uh, remarkably difficult to play. And, um, and our uh, students have had a real challenge making it happen. So uh, we're just thrilled to be here. I like his music a lot. He's written uh, a lot, quite a few brass band things, and oh I yeah, do a brass thing. band in, yep. here in town. And uh, um, yeah, they're they're exciting music, and uh, uh, so that's cool. I look forward. To, I have not heard one of his wind band pieces, so mm -hmm. um, that'll be really interesting. I think uh, the the for me that the, the besides the relevancy that ev everybody should be thinking about the the types of social injustice that mm -hmm. Last Breath is going to encompass is that it, it's. Uh, more and more the the generation of the people that's pl that are going to play this music uh that are uh, i find so often needing a, a a place to express that it's really true i've heard them described as the school shooting generation yeah you know mm -hmm. and uh you know and what we've uh, experienced over the last 20 or so years in this country uh, you can see where that's uh, the case yeah absolutely uh, well i really look forward to that um that's going to be uh yeah that's going to be a, m a moment and uh, the letter from home is f fun for me, too. I know the arranger, Brian Belsky, mm -hmm. who's a band director in Southern California, uh, and met him at the American Band College uh, when he was a student there. Uh, but the letter from home, this was uh, written for the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, right? This originally. Correct. Uh, and uh, it was such an interesting ensemble, because it was a chamber ensemble, large chamber format. They played lots of jazz, but they played lots of kind of stuff that was sort of classically, mm -hmm. cro we call it some of the kind of crossover. And that's sort thing, of yeah. what this is. You can hear me. You, it's, it's unmistakably Copeland. Absolutely, but it's a little whimsical in some moments, really whimsical. And, and in that particular letter that he had received that inspired this piece, he learned that several weeks before then, his mother had passed away. Mm. And, uh, uh, and so you're going to hear that in there. Yeah, you so know, like you, the you the hear the that uh, angst like in the there. Uh, uh, homesickness. That the the Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Cool. Wonderful. That's going to be awesome. Um, uh, when you're balancing out a four-year curriculum mm -hmm. for students that are going to hopefully be in that ensemble for a good portion of that at least or hopefully two if not more maybe hopefully the whole four times yes. the whole four years um is it difficult to balance between really wanting to have like social relevance like the, exactly where we should be in terms of that kind of now music mm -hmm. and uh also teaching to the few that are going to come through that are worthy on the performance and teaching to the profession in other words teaching to the mm -hmm. the what the military bands are expecting and then at the same time too for the the third clarinets and the second oboes and the first oboes mm -hmm. um that are aren't going to be in a jazz band but but wanting to leave them a little bit of a a trail so that when they get in in a military band and they've got to play a, a Broadway medley or something like that, that they've, that they've walked through those shoes once or twice before they have to imitate that. Yeah. Um, so that's the, I think I mean, it's probably the fun of the programming of it, but like to, to think in a four year arc of like, I got to bring everything that's now that's or as right. much as I can. Plus I got to leave them a, a trail of that. And at the same time, making sure that they leave and they don't go out at their first gig in rural New Jersey and program like Hidden Chirposi and Husa yeah, yeah. and exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a challenge, of course. And, and in our institution, we're primarily an undergraduate institution. Yep. And, and uh, our big major is music education. And so uh, you have to factor that in as well. Um, I, I feel like I'm helping to teach to learn uh, to teach them how to teach. 
mm -hmm. uh, with every moment that I work with them. Of course. And that has to do with what I'm trying to do, uh, but also with the music we're programming. Um, you know, um, and this is a first for us. This is a, a program of uh, basically all new music, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I thought it was uh, important to do something like that for this. Um, but when we go home, uh, we uh, start next Tuesday on David Maslanka's Seventh Symphony and, and uh, things like that and a little more uh, traditional wind pieces. And you have to balance them out. They, they need to exposure to both. And, and on the jazz question, uh, that's a really good one. My background happens to be in that area and so I feel a little fortunate in that regard and I'm kind of a warrior about that kind of stuff I really feel like it's important I mean jazz is the American music you know and yep. if you're not familiar with it uh, then I don't not sure you know how you're gonna uh, be successful at, at, at teaching young people you know and so uh, uh, we kind of insist that everybody uh, gets to do something like that while they are here it's it, it maybe more than one um, and, it's, and it's not so hard to do today because so many of the composers today are influenced by jazz. You can't be in this country for a very long time and grow up here and not be influenced yeah, not by have that. A right. Off of and that. so you hear that John Mackey, you hear all, you know, in, inside all of these uh, wonderful composers' music, you hear little snippets of that. And so uh, I try to highlight those moments and we try to teach them how to swing a little bit. And, and that's hard sometimes, you know, but, uh, but good. But good for them, I think. No, I, I mean, I, I feel like it's necessary. I mean, I, I can't. It was my first job was in the the president's own uh, and in the tuba section mm -hmm. and uh, mostly a professional sousaphone player for the four years that I was there. Mm -hmm. um, but the the ever since then, having sent students of my own or uh, people that won the job and then had their little interim period and like w an oboe player or a clarinet player and they're like, okay, what what am I gonna what am I, what's what's gonna go bam when exactly. I get there? And I'm like, okay, so how much jazz have you played? Have you played any Dixieland music? Have you played any Broadway music? Have you ever played a show? Because you need to know what a Broadway transition, which is none, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Subito, next tempo, Boom. right? Yep. And uh, um, uh, uh, stuff like that, and uh, because those are the things that you're going to sight read when you get to the when you get to the White House, exactly. and they throw a bunch of stuff at you. That's the, you're not going to be playing um, hardly any of this music um, for uh, the the patrons that are consuming military music at that at that level. So, and at the same time. Um, the the having to to walk through this um, information like to, like those last breaths and these are the based on the words of the last th things that they said right mm -hmm. uh, to to have that kind of meaning in the music allows you to bring that to those the the same kind of it's moments exactly of, of Miss Saigon or yes, whatever you're, it's exactly you're playing same. and um, um, so that that's the that's why I asked the question because I, I I know it's a it's a balancing act and I know that there's got to be some uh, occasionally some pushback from uh, in areas inside of a school where they're like, wait a minute, why why do my students have to learn how to swing right now? They play viola and uh, oboe and bassoon. And I'm like, do you yeah, want to make a living? Right, exactly. Do you know what but, I'm but saying? But there's <laughs> a part of this that, that we yeah. have to teach to the profession. Um, yeah. And uh, I think those are, I mean, and it's, you know, it's job power. It's this, like, many places that I went to school and, and have taught around the country, people were very afraid to let students double. Right. Um, uh, because it's going to do something wrong with your chops, or you're wasting your time. You got to get, you got to get the other stuff. You got to mm -hmm. be more specialized. And then, then I taught at UCLA um, for uh, more than five years, and uh, uh, j doubling is job power, right? Tripling is more job power. Um, and I had, I had one student that came in who had gone into the military, and then he went to San Francisco and he was freelance. Then he came back to school. He was a freshman when he was 38 years old, and he played everything from tenor horn down plus the jug. So everything from bluegrass, from all the tenor horn work. Which isn't a lot, um, and and then tenor trombone, lead trombone, bass trombone, euphonium, tuba. He never had to say no. I mean, yeah. there's like very few gigs where he's like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I don't play trumpet." But I mean, that was so much more ability to work, and uh, and then the ability to speak all these different style languages um, made him a like a vastly important member. When I had the last year that I was there, I had the wind ensemble. Uh, Tom had retired, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and I. It was like the people that were the ones that were the heavily jazz influenced, mm -hmm. and and the the improvisers and the chamber music folks were the the, the wonderful leaders in a wind ensemble. It's really true. You really built the pillars of your of your group. So, and, and when you think about that, then you think about like, well, it's not always the ones that are those leaders that are the ones that become successful in a playing career, or in a national guard band, mm -hmm. or in a, you know what I mean. Yes. Later on, uh, frequently is the the ones that are in the middle. 
that's exactly that, right. That, that pop up a little bit later on in their development, and then we're like, oh man, I didn't leave them any breadcrumbs for how to survive going through carousel. That's really true. That's really true. We're very fortunate. We don't have a lot of graduate students in this particular ensemble, but the few that we have, some of them are really quite experienced, and they're coming back to school to get a degree, to finish a degree, and uh, it, having them in the ensemble has really, really helped. It's really changed things. They've been great role models, you know, and they're saying some of the exact same things to them that you are saying here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and trying to tell them about sort of what it's like outside of the, the sort of structured and actually kind of safe world of academia, um, what it's like out there, you know, uh, sure. if you want to wander out there and to give that a go, what that's going to be like. And uh, boy, that's valuable information. Yeah. Well, and, well and, the, and I mean, the beauty of the safe world of academia is that there's a great place to you know, it's a great it experiment for experimentation. Of course. Exactly. Of course, you can be free here. Um, and uh, that's the that's the that's the point. That would be that would be the missed opportunity of, exactly. of academia to to, to, to to not do that. Um, but I also I always find that interesting. And I always. So let me ask you this then. Sure. So you come from a jazz background, a mm-hmm. part of your background. Mm-hmm. Do you find if you could if you if you do I, probably when you let it float to the macro level, they all the same pedagogy. But if you separate it into like, okay, this pedagogy came from my jazz band experience this pedagogy came from either ensemble or private lessons do you feel like there's a lot of things that you learn that you that you know how to do as a jazz band leader that are really relevant pedagogic tools on the band podium you know one of my wonderful trumpet teachers who was wonderful at this uh he he could play anything anything and um any style and he always said, playing trumpets, playing trumpet. You know, the style of the music might change. Um, some of how you articulate might change. Maybe the sort of the, 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 the burnishment of the tone or whatever might have to change a bit. But there's not a great deal of difference between playing first trumpet in an orchestra and playing lead trumpet in a jazz band. I mean, there just isn't. It's the, there's the same sort of mindset. Sure, d- you know, don't freak out, folks, when you heard me say that. But, you know, really the mindset is basically the same. Mm-hmm. You know, the equipment might be different and blah, 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 all of the obvious things. But, uh, no, I really, uh, <laughs> either you can play or you can't. I mean, in many ways. And, um, you know, uh, having as much exposure, as many opportunities, as much experience as you could glean, you know, particularly from your time uh, in college. Yeah, for you know, sure. That's, that's really going to make your life easier and make you a little more marketable when you get out there. Absolutely. No matter what you do. Yeah, absolutely. But well, some of those places, there you, like, a lot of those musicians show up at, at uh, as music ed majors that have all these, and you're like, where did this come from? And they sometimes they come, a lot of times they come from smaller schools, mm-hmm. which frequently are rural. And so if they're gonna, if a band director is gonna fill it out, it's like, well, he's got to take his first clarinet player, and she's got to play lead alto in the jazz band. But then you, s- then if you go teach at the school three hours later, when the second jazz band comes in during lunch, she's playing second trombone. That's right. And you're like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> you have, and I'm, like thinking, and I'm like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a band director. I was like, do you have any idea how great a setup this is it's for you? It's the truth, man. It's absolutely the truth. Uh, and uh, so I think that's the, it's like the, one of the things that I was always trying to push with the, some of the college folks was like, well, i got a little bit extra time. What do you think I should do? I was like, oh, man, you should join the Gamelon Ensemble. Or you should like move it around. Or and, go sing. Uh, go yeah, sing exactly. somewhere. Exactly. You know, join the choir. You know, seriously, I mean, uh, uh, that kind of exposure to that sort of music and that sort of awareness of your body, man, that, that, that's so valuable. Yeah, that was, the, that, was the, that was the best thing that Arnold Jacobs did for me. So he was my tuba teacher mm-hmm. as my first two years of schooling in Chicago. And uh, he's, he, he would not allow me to take a private lesson with him, if it, unless I, I, even though he wasn't my teacher at Northwestern, unless I showed him registration for a choir. He was like, you have to sing in a choir if you want to take a lesson with me. And it was, uh, it was two messages. One was like that, mm-hmm. learn to use your body, it's and it's wonderful to to hear that but the other one was was like you're looking at music and you can't hear so you need to go practice that part and you need to become vocally able to connect your ear to your to your voice absolutely i think also too knowing that like of all the rehearsing that we do and all the information in the score study that we do probably the thing that we use the most as a teaching tool is is singing to our students right well true absolutely i mean that's the, the you know one of the few ways i mean our instrument the baton makes no sound so it's the only way we have to communicate on the podium, really. Absolutely. Yeah. These are great messages. This is so gl- I'm so glad we sort of we sort of got got to this place because uh, uh, that's the 
I think that's the thing that is uh, an obvious thing when you're at a, an institution that's primarily undergraduate and that's uh, a, has a large portion of it that's dedicated to music education. Yes. Um, you got to get everybody to wear a whole bunch of hats before they walk out the door Absolutely. for them to have any shot at being, you know, surviving. I agree. Surviving. I agree. It, it's not good enough just to be good anymore. I mean, the, you know, you got to be great. Yeah. You know, when you go out and apply for these jobs that 200 other people are going to apply for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but having said all those things, those are the people in the military bands in Washington, D.C., or in Los Angeles, for example, that are having the most amount of success, either with a freelance career or uh, some sort of combination military and freelance career outside of it, just because they they came from a place like that where they, they learned to speak all kinds of different stylistic languages. Many of them play multiple instruments. A lot of them li like to sing. Um, and uh, um, and so they can find avenues that are n that are vocational and avocational. Yep. So uh, 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 imagine balance in a musician's life. Absolutely. I didn't right. say that out loud. I know, right? I <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and uh, so I think that's those are really Im important messages to, to to tell our audience, uh, especially at a at an all college, uh, very high level university. Absolutely. Uh, offering it's like yeah but they ha you have to have all these different skills especially those those are the ones that make them the your prized members for performing this kind of music actually um, no, I agree with that uh, and uh, I find that I, uh, my, my, the uh, associate principal trombone of the Los Angeles Philharmonic is Jim Miller mm -hmm. we taught together at UCLA and uh, he frequently especially if he's on the first half of the show but he's not on the second half in the trombone section mm -hmm. it goes down to a three person section he's out the door on a Friday or Saturday night to play a salsa gig somewhere, yeah. and I'm like, "What?" Well, he's like, "Well, I, you know, I, I need to, I need it emotionally." But he says it's also good for my face to be super strong. He says yeah. it's a completely different kind of good for him. Not language. everybody has that kind of mindset. And right? I was That's like, great. "That is like the healthiest thing I've ever heard from yeah. a like a top-notch orchestral yeah. player." Like, "Yeah, I got, uh, what? I got to take this week off because I'm playing with a hot yeah. salsa band." I'm like, yeah. "Yes." Yeah. Um, but seeking that as well, uh, it's like. By the time you're looking over your shoulder, going like, "Man, how do I balance all this stuff?" Is the you know, it's like <laughs> it's too late. You know what I mean? Right. To so the to to broaden your horizons musically from an ensemble standpoint, at the especially when you can, right? When you have the opportunity, it's yeah, such a great it. idea. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. This is a pleasure. Thank I'm you. really looking forward to this program and uh, uh, appreciate you you know sort of pulling back the curtain about how you put it together and Absolutely. why you wanted to offer what you wanted to offer and uh um so it's awesome i'm, I'm looking forward to this as, as like i said before we we started to roll i've been a, a long time ago was a I was a guest at montclair state and yep. and really enjoyed it and a lot of those people that i that i met there uh that were students they came actually they came to visit you last night the box yes. jen and matt um uh but uh and then matt's brother kevin was a student here at arizona state university mm -hmm. um uh, of Sam Palafians and myself, so it was, uh, it's uh, it's cool. I'm excited. Sort of feel like it's almost like a like a hometown band for me, even though it's you know yeah. I just visited just for a few days, and uh, so I'm looking really looking forward. Thanks so much for yeah. spending time with us and and, uh, and you. sharing your philosophy with how this call comes together. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.